Stefano. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to, to be the first speaker, first, first lecturer of the school. I'm extremely happy to, to give these lectures. Uh, and I think it's a, the, the choice of uh, having effective field theories as a, the first lecture, I think it's, a, it's appropriate because uh, as we will see, effective field theories are really uh, uh, everything we do in high energy physics. So every uh, theory that we construct is eventually an effective field theory. And indeed, uh, the, the importance of, a, of effective theories is actually at the heart of, of a scientific uh, progress, I would say, because uh, it's really at, at the root of, of uh, reductionism. Reductionism uh, states that if you want to describe a, a system, physical system, then you can do this by uh, focusing on the important uh, parameters uh, and, and, um, and energy range uh, that you are interested in. And, and forgetting uh, for simplicity about other limits of, of, uh, of your parameters and, and, and energy scales. Um, just to give an idea, if you want to, to do uh, biology, you want to discuss, uh, you want to describe uh, the, the behavior of a, of a living body, for example, an animal, you don't need to have equations for describing uh, the molecules or the atoms uh, which made these, uh, these animals. Uh, similarly, if you want to do chemistry, okay, if, you, if you go to a different layer of, of, uh, of energy or distances, you don't need to know that the, the equations which govern the, the dynamics of quarks. Okay? So you see that every branch of, of, uh, of, uh, of science is Founded on on the on the notion of the of the, the the notion of reductionism, so the possibility to focus on that uh, uh, regime of of distances of, of energies of parameters that you, you need to address to discuss your to describe your, your system, without the need of, of uh, having knowledge of the fundamental uh, laws of nature. Okay. And similarly, also in the case of uh, particle physics, uh, we know that we, uh, we have been exploring uh, uh, particle physics uh, uh, on uh, vastly, immensely uh, vast energy scales, range of energy scales. And, um, and, and so phenomena on, a, on, a, on, a, on one scale can be described uh, without knowledge of uh, physics at much more fundamental uh, distances and, and, uh, and energy, okay? So that's the, the idea. Um, so in, in the case of, of, uh, of, of uh, high energy physics, uh, or more broadly, theoretical physics, uh, there are very simple examples of effective theories. Uh, you know uh, that classical mechanics is uh, certainly can be considered as an effective description uh, of a more fundamental relativistic theory uh, in the limit of uh, small velocities. So uh, Newtonian mechanics is, uh, is the non-relativistic limit of, uh, of relativistic uh, dynamics. And, and at the same time, classical mechanics is also uh, a limit of, uh, uh, of a more fundamental quantum uh, mechanics in the limit in which uh, distances are larger than the degree uh, wavelength. Okay, so that's, uh, again, there are two limits that you can, you can make. Um, another uh, very famous uh, example uh, of, uh, of effective theories is, is the multiple uh, uh, expansion in, uh, in electrostatics. So if you have a distribution of charges, and if you want to describe this uh, system of charges at a distance, um, then you can you can make an expansion in uh, in, uh, in multiples. So the, the the first information okay is the total charge of, of your system. Then the, the if you if you are able to resolve a bit more uh, the system of charges, then uh, you you are sensitive to the dipole, okay, then the quadrupole, and so on. Okay. So even in that case, uh, everything is classical in this uh, in this example. But even in that case, the, there is a notion and a, and a of effective theory, uh, and, and that's very useful 
okay, to treat very complex uh, systems like uh, those with many charges. Now, in the case of, uh, of, of the theories that we are going to discuss, uh, we, we want to zoom, okay, we want to focus on uh, effective field theories. Okay, so these are theories which describe uh, the low energy limit of a more fundamental theory, which could be uh, a field theory, quantum field theory itself, or it could be something else. It could be something more fundamental, like, for example, string theory uh, or, or something that we in principle, we might not know, okay? But we, uh, as we are going to see, uh, the assumption is that the low energy, whatever it is, is a fundamental, more fundamental physics, it has a description in terms of a, a quantum field theory, which is, a, of course, a, a relativistic quantum uh, theory. And we are going to focus on, the, on a scenario in which the fundamental theory has uh, some degrees of freedom, some asymptotic states, which eventually would be particles, which are heavy, okay, much heavier than the energies uh, that we can test, uh, that we can uh, access, uh, for example, in, a, in an experiment. And then there is another uh, set of, of, uh, of particles, of asymptotic states, which are instead uh, of order of the energies accessible or even lighter, the, the energy accessible at, at the experiment, much lighter okay, than the heavy particles. And what we want to describe in our effective theory is the low energy limit okay, in which you can uh, produce, for example, through scattering, okay, uh, only, you can produce only the light degrees of freedom. Okay. So the, the heavy degrees of freedom will not be part of the effective theory. They will be, uh, as we will see, integrated out. So this is the jargon. I'm sure you're already, you're already familiar, but I wanted to uh, stress the fact that we want to focus on these kind of theories because there are other possible descriptions, uh, in fact, within particle, particle theory, uh, other effective theories, which I'm not going to, to cover, but I want to mention here because uh, they are very uh, popular and very important for particle theory. So let me... Let me zoom, okay? And uh, so what are these other theories that uh, you can you may consider? So well, first of all, there is no relativistic theory. Okay? That's uh, a theory in which you describe uh, massive, so massive P1 of particles plus Electrodynamics of electromagnetic field. And these massive particles uh, are those which are a part of the degrees the degree of freedom which are very heavy. So you describe them as energy is much lower than their mass, and for this reason they are more relativistic. Okay. And for example, uh, positronium, the system is a physical system you can describe in a systematic way, uh, through this theory, you can make predictions. So this theory I'm not going uh, to discuss, but let me give you some, some references if you are interested. So for example, for neurodynamic QED, you might want to see this reference. Mother, page thirty six, archive number fifteen of two zero four. Then uh, a, a similar, a similar uh, theory, which is also not relativistic, is not relativistic. So this is a theory which allows you to, to describe, uh, for example, uh, quarkonia, uh, which are bound states made of two heavy quarks. Okay, so in the context of QCD, of course. 
and you want to describe the systems and energies which are uh, much smaller than, than the quarks, uh, the heavy quarks themselves, which are more realistic. But interact with quarks, interact with uh, with uh, gluons and uh, and also light light quarks. Okay. So uh, if you want to to have a discussion, if you want to have an introduction to this to this uh, effective theory. Okay. You might want to see, but let me give you the reference instead, okay. because there is also another uh, 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 similar effect theory, which is a heavy quark effect theory. So this, this instead allows you to describe systems of made of one heavy and one light quark, of course, in the context of PCD. And, um, and then here the difference is that, of course, for example, is about the size of the pulse space because uh, here there is one uh, heavy uh, state which is uh, making the core of the, uh, the pulse space plus it's uh, much more much lighter than the freedom which forms like a cloud of ground mass around this heavy core. So if you want to have an introduction to this, you might want to see. The lectures given by Mamel at Les Bush. in 2017. Okay. Well, you find them on the web, so they, they, are, they are giving me introduction to follow this. And then there is also another. Uh, let me let me write here. So there is another effective theory, which is a soft collinear effective theory. Okay. So this theory instead uh, is a, is an effective theory describing very energetic processes. For example, uh, the decay of a heavy meson. Or uh, a very highly energetic scattering, scattering with a large apparent mass, uh, where the final states instead uh, have very small invariant masses. Okay, so for example, if you have a heavy quark decaying to light, uh, light mesons, then this is a, a process which can be described, described by scattering. So energetic processes. Uh, final state with small mass. Now, I'm not going to discuss these theories, but these theories are, are special, they're uh, different from the ones that uh, I'm going to discuss. Sorry, here I, I can give you. Uh, references, for example, there is a book by Thomas Becker. So this is archive number of four one zero. And then you can also see Thomas Becker's lectures at Bezouche 2017, the same school as Thomas Becker. So I would say that these, uh, these theories, these effective theories are, um, if you, if you, Look, <clears throat> there are all theories in which you have in your effective description some uh, heavy modes. Okay? For example, these masses be one of particles or the heavy quarks, or you have to describe, you, you, you want to describe you, you, with your effective theories uh, processes occurring at energies much larger okay? than, uh, than, uh, than the momentum describing, the momentum of the, of the light, light degrees of freedom. So they are different. They are uh, different from what we want to uh, discuss in these lectures. For example, these states uh, might be around because they, they are stable or because of some conservation law 
or maybe they decay, uh, for example, in, the, in this case, they decay to uh, weak interactions which occur on much longer uh, time scales with respect to the QCD interaction. So they can approximately uh, consider as a, as a as tables, or you have to describe processes which are uh, highly energetic. Okay. So these theories are, are, are very interesting, but this would uh, take us another course to describe them. So I will focus instead on a, on a more standard, uh, quote unquote, situation in which uh, you, you have in your effective description only light modes and uh, the energies in, in, uh, involved in your, in your processes are much smaller than the mass of the heavy, heavy state. Okay. Now, <coughs> let me... Let me give you some references, uh, additional references for uh, the kind of theories that we are going to uh, discuss. When preparing my lectures, I was uh, having a look at, uh, in particular, a few of these uh, references, okay, that those that I'm going to write, uh, which I found uh, very useful. I think, I think my favorite references are lectures by Georgi. Then there are lectures by David Kaplan. The most recent ones are at this, uh, at, at this school, at the, at the GGI school. The GGI school. And for those you should, you should see the GGI website. And then uh, there are also the lectures he gave at the seminary. are found on the archive as nuclear pH 0, 1.0023. Finally, I also like uh, those by Anish Manoa. And these are also lectures delivered at these are my favorite, but of course there are many other sets of, of, of reviews. Okay. Okay. Let me let me give you uh, a very brief introduction. Ah, by the way, I should tell you the plan of the uh, of these lectures. Okay. The plan of these lectures is very simple. There will be a part one. Which is an introduction to effective field theory. And as I told you, by effective field theories here, I really mean uh, effective quantum field theories. Okay. And then there will be a part two, which will be uh, uh, discussing topics which are closer to research which is in particular focusing on the standard model as an effective field theory. And which is exactly the language that has been using and has been used today uh, at high uh, 
and uh, high energy experiments like the, those carried at the LSE. Okay. So part one, uh, there will be a first general introduction. Okay. That we cover today. Then there will be a discussion about effective theories from known UE theories. And then there will be a part on effective theories from unknown UE theories. But the point is that uh, you can construct an effective theory both if you know the UE. Okay? And here we will see, we will discuss today that it's crucial uh, a procedure uh, which goes under the name, the name of matching because you know both theories and you want to match them in such a way that uh, the effective field theory is tuned to reproduce the low energy regime, the low energy limit of the, of the full theory. But effective field theories can also be used when you don't know the UV. Okay, so you want to, and if you want, this is a closer to in, in spirit to what I was uh, mentioning at the beginning about the reductionism. So you don't know, or maybe you, you don't don't want to know <laughs> the the, you know, the the laws governing the fundamental dynamics, but you want to focus on the region of, of energies and, and distances that are most relevant for your process. Then based on uh, on uh, the rules that we're going to, to spell out and, uh, and, and making use of, of argument, uh, symmetry arguments, you can construct your effective field theory. Okay, so and, and then we are going to discuss what you can, uh, what you can, what you can say uh, about uh, these cases as well. Okay, so let me let me start a bit, and then I will stop uh, asking for questions. Now, the first question you might have is uh, why effective field theories should work? Why should I be, should I be able to construct this uh, effective description? And why don't I have to, to know the fundamental laws uh, in order to describe any system, any physical system? Why, why does this work? What is the magic behind this? Well, the magic behind this is locality. Locality uh, is, uh, and, and we're going to discuss it in, in, in the context of, uh, of uh, particle physics. Locality tells you that if you have the full theory and you exchange heavy particles, heavy degrees of freedom, these, uh, uh, the effects of these degrees of freedom, these heavy degrees of freedom, will look as local at uh, very low energies. Okay. And again, if you think, this is very intuitive, if you think about, for example, the multipole expansion, uh, that's exactly what, what's happening. If you, if you have your, if you want to describe your uh, very complicated system, system of, of, uh, of many charges, static charges, by a very far distance, okay, in first approximation, if you are very, very, very far, then this system will look like a point, okay, with some charge, overall charge. If you instead uh, make very precise experiments, then maybe you can tell that this is not a point, okay? But there is a, there is actually some. You start resolving some structure, and this structure is uh, uh, described at first approximation uh, by a dipole interaction, okay? And so on. The the, the more uh, is your precision, okay? And, and and the more structure you can resolve. So and that's the, the idea of uh, also of what was happening in uh, high energy theory. Okay? In, a, in, your, in your theory, if you describe the, the propagation, the, the, the virtual uh, propagation, because you cannot excite in our, in, our, uh, in our theories, you cannot excite the heavy modes as external modes, okay? but the 
you can circulate as, as virtual uh, particles, uh, if, if you exchange this mode, then they, they will propagate uh, on short distances if you inject in your, in, your, in your system a small amount of energy. Okay? So if the energy is very small, this propagation will really look uh, local. Okay? So uh, the, the, the effects will, will, uh, will look like uh, a local, local uh, effect. So since the, the effect is local, and by the way, uh, I'm, I'm saying some words, okay? everything is intuitive, but the, the, the justification again on a, on a 2D level comes from uh, the uncertainty principle. Okay? The uncertainty principle tells you okay, So if you want to uh, if you want to exchange something very heavy, okay, whose mass is uh, capital M, but then okay, to a process in which the energy is much smaller, okay, so that the, the, you can create a, a virtually this a, a state which is much heavier than the energy disposal, okay, so which means delta E of order m only for a very short time okay which means okay, in our relativistic theory uh, delta t is, uh, is nothing else than the length of propagation and then it means that uh, that the, the length of propagation okay will be smaller than one length. so that uh, thanks to the uncertainty Take this as a, as a very intuitive, uh, uh, I don't think it's a proof, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument in favor of locality. And then I'm going to, to give you another uh, less qualitative, but still not uh, completely rigorous proof of why we can construct a, an effective theory. I don't think there is a theorem, uh, but there is a, a a list of very uh, intuitive and, and, and reasonable arguments in favor of, of, of the possibility of constructing effective theory. So this is the first. The fact that this is a, the, the effects due to the exchange of heavy particles uh, uh, are local, it uh, allows you to construct your effective theory by reproducing these effects through local operators. So in the effective theory, the effective theory would be one, in which because you organize your Lagrangian as uh, a leading term, which describes the dynamics of your light fields, plus a series of operators, which are local operators. Okay, so these are local operators. With some uh, coefficient which encodes basically uh, all the details of the of the UV dynamics. So these are the so-called effective So these are all the possible local operators that you, you can write, which means that they have to have the right quantum numbers. Okay? For example, they have to be invariant under any global symmetry which your system might have, and of course they have to be gauge invariant. Okay, but then there is no restriction on the dimensionality of these operators. In fact, this is a series. The series can be organized as a as a as a, as a series of increasing dimensionality of the operators. We will see. Okay. Now the fact that you can construct the, the effective theory in this way in terms of local operators and, and the and the UV dynamics is uh, is encoded. Here in the in the value of these coefficients is already giving you a uh, factorization of effects, okay? Because these coefficients, first of all, are computed once forever, okay? But I either computed or in any case they encode these, uh, these dynamics for any kind of process because they are built in in the they are, they are parameters of your Lagrangian. Why, depending on your on your uh, uh, process on your or, on your situation, you will have to uh, compute the, the matrix elements of these operators okay, on different uh, external states. 
Okay. And, and, and the factorization uh, of the infrared and UV dynamics okay, is, uh, is uh, manifest in the, in the way in which I wrote the Lagrange, because there is a factorization of the operators times their coefficient. Now, so this is already the structure is already something non trivial, and everything, as I said, is based on locality. Now, uh, if your UV theory is a, is a quantum field theory itself, which might not be necessarily the case, but let's consider this, this situation, then you can see that locality actually. Uh, is, is uh, intimately connected with the, the analytic structure of the green functions of the complete theory of the UV theory. Let me, let me explain this. So uh, you, you can now, if, if your UV theory is a, is, a, is a quantum field theory, you know that you can describe the theory in terms of free functions, and in particular, you, you can consider connected free functions, okay, uh, which have, for example, n and point. Okay. Now, these this free functions uh, will be described by a set of momenta, okay, for FPI. And then I am, so this, this would be renormalized. Let me consider directly the renormalized connected functions. And then there will be uh, a dependence on the light. I'm, I'm simplifying, no? uh, uh, trying to be schematic. So the light mass plus k which is characterized in normalized states and the heavy scale. And of course, there will be dependence on the, on the normalization scale. Okay. Now let me set for simplicity mu equal to capital M for this discussion. Okay, this is very, very uh, naive and, and uh, intuitive. Okay. So the great function. We go like uh, as, a, as a function of a uh, of moment, but if I if I work at fixed angles, okay, if, if you want, if I scale all the momenta with the same parameter, for example, if you do a scattering process, that is this means of working at fixed angles, okay. So you you change only the overall uh, scale energy scale. So work. All momentum. Okay. Parameter. Then this green function will have a certain uh, dimensionality, okay, which you can easily easily derive. Uh, I'm working in the momentum phase, so for example, if you have uh, that this green function is coming okay, from a green function of n fields that you can denote by phi, then each field will have a dimensionality d, okay, which could be one, for example, for a scalar field in the third dimension. Then you have to do uh, Fourier trans transport each of these uh, coordinates, uh, take into account. That the degree function is defined uh, up to an overall delta function. Okay. And then you will see, okay, if I didn't make any mistake, you will see, you will find that the overall dimensionality is uh, p squared to the n, where n is the number of legs, okay, d minus 4 divided by 2, okay, plus 2. And then you're left with a, with a, with a function. Which is dimensionless. And now this function is a fixed mu to capital M. It, it's just a function of two variables. So P 
two ratios of k. For example, you can choose p squared divided by little m squared and p squared divided by capital M squared. And now you can you can use uh, the analytic properties of this uh, of this function. Now this function, uh, the analytic properties of, of uh, genetic endpoint uh, green functions are very actually are not well known. Okay, they are not known uh, rigorously. Okay. <laughs> Uh, except for the case of two-point functions, okay, for which there is, for those that uh, there is the ch challenge lemma uh, decomposition, this is very rigorous. Okay, some results are known for four-point functions, for example, uh, those characterizing two, two scatterings. But in general, for genetic and point function, the truth is that we don't know uh, rigorously okay, the analytic structure. But okay, uh, on an intuitive side, it's a um, it's clear that this this uh, the, 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 this uh, function f and the function the, the two arguments would have some singularities, and the singularities, as you know, are coming from single single poles. Okay, so simple sorry, simple poles from single particle. Uh, a change, okay. and then there are uh, branch cuts, branch cuts from multi-particle, multi-particle. Okay. I'm going to do, to to do in a momentarily. Uh, an example of a two to two scattering amplitude, and, and there it could be more clear. Now, the point is the fact that if you if you evaluate this function, the green function, for values of this argument, okay, but actually for values of any of, of either of these two arguments, away from the from the singularity, away from the single poles and, and, and the cuts, then this uh, this function is analytic. Okay. And there you can think of making a, a Taylor expansion. Now we are, in particular, we are, we are interested in the singularities coming, okay, uh, singularities uh, related to this variable, because this variable okay, is the one controlling the, the effective field theory expansion. Okay. So if we are in momenta much smaller than the mass of the heavy, heavy modes, then we can expand these group functions in Taylor uh, in, their, in, in, in the second variable, not the first one, but the second variable, the, the green function still will have a very complicated non analytic uh, dependence on the first variable, but on the second variable, I can make a Taylor expansion. And then you see that the, the effects of these uh, heavy particles are described uh, by a Taylor expansion, which I can do because I'm very uh, far from the, from the singularities, where the, where the, the function is. Uh, is analytic in the second in the second argument, okay. and and this expansion of p square divided by capital M square is is entirely captured by in the effective theory by the insertions of these local operators. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to focus a bit more, uh, let me do it on the slide work. Slightly more concrete example. Uh, in four dimensions, and it is uh, five dimensional. Roberto? Yeah. We have a question, so maybe uh, Please. I can. Hi there, thank you. Um, I maybe just missed this, but why is the p squared in the generic form of the Green's function raised to the power of the um, the light degree of freedom, the small m? The small m. No, the, you mean the prefactor in front? It's little m p squared to the little m, uh -huh. where n is the number of. Uh, so let me lower it Got it. That makes more sense. So that's not the the light mass. No, this little this, this uh, letter is n. Okay, it's the number of length. You meant this one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, no, no, this is the number of legs. Do this exercise, okay? So you start with this, okay? This is a, okay? an n point dream function, okay? And then take the dimensionality of the field uh, little d, okay? Which might be whatever it is, because I'm, I don't know what, what this field is. Okay? It might be a composite operator, it might be, might be anything. Okay, so but, uh, let me call d the dimension of this field, okay? Then, of course, you have d times n, because you have n of these fields, okay? But then you have to make, uh, for each field, you have to make a Fourier transform, okay? And then you have to take into account that the, the, the Fourier transform of this uh, Greek function is equal to a delta function, okay? Delta 4 of uh, the sum of all the momenta, which takes into account the power population data. Times this geometry. Okay. So if you do this, then you should find this, uh, this free factor. Of course, once you pull out the free factor, which is completely fixed by the national analysis, then uh, this is multiplied by the national function. Of course, here the trick is that I've said to you equal to n. Okay. If you do this, and then I'm going to justify why, why this is a good choice. Uh, then at this point, you have just these two arguments. Okay, and uh, and then you can tailor the sum in the second one. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, let me let me try to clarify a bit more with a with a specific uh, example where you have a few stuff. Well, maybe these are the fifth. Okay, I have two, two, three. Okay, and I, I'm doing this at equal to zero. So it's a forward. I told you you have to fix the, the angles in this case. Uh, so I'm going to see to describe only the forward coupling. And then, of course, uh, and, and, and what I do as scatter? Well, I scatter light particles. Okay. So, so these particles, okay, they will have mass little m. Okay. While here, okay, in, in the in the field function, there will be an exchange of both the light and the heavy ones. So, the scattering amplitude will be described by by function, okay, which will be, will be a function that's dimensional in this case, and will be a function of s divided by uh, divided by little m, the mass of the light modes, and, and s divided by capital S. Okay. Why only one variable? Well, at first, because we know that s plus t plus u is equal to 4 m squared. In this case, t we set it to zero, okay, so u is fixed. In terms of s, so eventually, of course, the scattering amplitude is a is a is a sum of terms divided by by uh, crossing. Okay. But eventually, everything can be described in terms of a single function of s. Okay. However, which is a function of two arguments. Okay. So this I can call uh, well. This is the first one. This is the second one. Now, uh, as a function of these arguments, uh, well, let me get to this. The poles and the singularities are as follows. So, okay, so I'm going to look okay, at this function, this, uh, this amplitude as a function of x and y, where x is this and y is this. So, in the x plane, then there is a, there is a, in fact, in, in the plane, if you want uh, x times. M squared, let me, let me multiply by M squared, such a way that you understand the meaning of the singularity. So here there is a branch cut okay, starting at 4 M squared, where you can, in this uh, function, you can start producing two particles, light particles on shell. And now, because of crossing, and because of this relation, you can see that. If uh, S is equal to, uh, uh, because of crossing, okay, there will be a, 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 a 
classical singularity uh, in, in, the, in the variable u, okay, starting again for m squared, which means at this point is t is equal to zero, that uh, there will be another branch cut starting at zero. Okay, so the presence of this cut again is due to crossing to the fact that you can you can exchange uh, S and U, okay, and because of, of these uh, of these uh, identity tells you that when you have a branch cut in the U plane starting at four little m square, okay, then uh, this uh, this singularity likes to be a branch cut in S starting at zero. Okay, so these are the singularities due to the exchange of light mode. And we are not actually interested in those. But then in the plane y times m capital m square, there will be other singularities that have another branch cut starting now capital 4m square. Okay. And then here, symmetrically, there will be one which is starting at minus 4 capital m square plus 4 zero m square. Okay. That's the beginning. Of the branch cut. And now you see, so this mass is very heavy, that's the assumption. So we, we, we can focus on the on the energy uh, region, which is close to the origin in this plane. And of course, there will be there will be no linear no analytic behavior due to the other singularity. Okay, so here the, the, the entire scattering object is not. Analytic close to the origin. But seen as a, as a function of the second argument, of the second argument, then it will be okay, analytic. So we can tailor expand. Okay, tailor expand in the second argument, which means that it will not A of S over A of S squared as for capital S squared. This will have been written as the tailor expansion. Less over capital M square. Okay, so let's go this half up. Times some coefficients, okay. which are all the functions of the light function. Okay, and, and this form is the one that I want to match with the vector field. Of course, here this is an infinite series. Okay, and what I can do. Is to uh, write an effective theory only with a finite number of, of, of operators. So the, the, the sum that I was writing uh, before, in principle, is uh, over operators is a, is a, is a, is a sum, is an infinite sum. But eventually, if you want to have a, a, some useful uh, description on the terms of the calculation, then you need to truncate it. But uh, the point, as we are going to discuss in a, in a second, is that if you want to, to work at a finite uh, precision, if you want to make a description of your system at a finite precision, then you can truncate. Okay? And, um, and this truncation on this point, thanks to uh, locality and, and the context of free function of uh, analyticity, uh, can be described by the insertion of this, uh, of this effective operator. Okay. Roberto? Please. There is another question. Please. Yeah, that's in fact a good moment to stop and uh, ask for questions. Okay, so we have the first one. Go ahead. Hi. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit confused about this. Uh, how, how did you derive these uh, uh, relations from analyticity? That's the first thing. And before even that, like, we are considering here a two to two scattering of like a small, small m going to big m and like what is the process that we're considering that maybe maybe I just missed that point. Yeah, the process is, uh, is the scattering that we call, let's say that your theory, I don't want to give names because uh, this is supposed to be completely general. So it's not, of course, try okay, as, a, as a more elaborate, uh, elaborated uh, exercise, you can try and, and write a theory, a full theory with two kinds of fields. For example, uh, some scalar field, which is, uh, which, which is light as a, as a mass little m. And, and then another scalar field, which is, uh, which is heavy as a mass capital M. Okay? And, and then you can introduce uh, 
uh, interactions, sporting interactions between between the two. Okay, so you can. Uh, in fact, here I was not putting any any four. Okay, because I yeah, I, I got confused about that because in that y m square plane we should start the pole from like four m square, right? Four mol m square. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. That was the starting point of my confusion. Okay. True. True. That's a good. That's a good question. Yes, it depends whether you you can excite uh, a single particle or not. Okay. Mm. So yeah. if you can, then you also have a pole. Okay, for sure. For example, if you write a Lagrangian and you want to do a perturbative uh, example, then you might have the new, let's call it the uh, calligraphic, calligraphic pi is the light field, okay, is my with the M, okay, then there will be the heavy field, which I will call capital pi, okay, with the heavy mass. And then I was thinking of introducing uh, quarty couplings like uh, y square and lambda y square, something like this. Okay, but of course you can also have terms which are which go like uh, capital phi plus phi cube, then okay, to another plane, phi three, for example. And then of course you can have diagrams, okay, in which you have two little pi to calligraphic pi to capital pi okay? and then here yes you would have a pole otherwise okay otherwise if you don't have the, that in your coupling for example suppose that there is a that there is a z2 symmetry okay under which uh each of, of these two fields is uh, is off okay so this term is not allowed okay? and then you will not have this pole if this coupling up oh, okay Okay, that's a possibility, and then and then you have only the multi particle threshold here. This is what I had in mind. But of course, there can be. But the point is that in any case, any singularity in this plane is controlled by capital M. Okay, so in the limit in which capital M is much much larger than the energy uh, that you exchange in this country, then basically this means that you are uh, now looking. At some neighborhood of the, the origin, and the and and, and the scattering amplitude that the function of y is uh, is analytic, and there you can see. Okay, thank thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your Any other question? Okay, well, uh, still I want to continue and make uh, two examples. And I'm sure that you are familiar with these examples. Uh, just to see how how things work okay, uh, more in detail in, in, the, in the case in which you can do perturbation theory. So the first example is the, the theory made by Fermi to describe this interaction. And that's a very standard example, but let me let me tell you anyway. Okay. So, okay. so if you want to describe the decay, for example, of, of a, the decay of the neutron product of a neutrino, then you write, uh, well, if you have the full theory, the theory is the, the weak thing. Interaction diagram. Here, you exchange, you exchange the W, okay, the say minus, and, uh, and then you will have two minus alpha okay, and then you should compute this uh, this amplitude. Okay. This you can do easily because you know everything. Okay, there will be the like normal perturbation theory. I think that there should be a factor two combinatorial factor. Then there will be for each vertex there will be coupling. Okay, so here the W and the coupling G are less than two. Then there will be the propagator for for W that's called two the momentum. Flowing the W line. Okay, and then there will be the, the spin 
charts. So here is the new uh, bar for the proton, and there will be gamma mu one minus gamma five divided by two mu of the neutron, mu bar of I think of the electron, gamma mu one minus gamma five two mu for the neutron. Okay, here there are also terms proportional to q mu q mu, but once you act on these terms of the of the conserved currents, in particular the static ones, then uh, they give you very small corrections, so throw them out. Okay, keep on doing this. Basically, uh, this is your green function, okay? Uh, it's a four-point green function, and, and here you can you, you see very concretely that you can expand okay, in q squared divided by w squared. Okay, so basically, these are the square of the double square, which is one plus the square and double square plus the fourth and the fourth plus the double one. Okay, so you see that there is a better expansion around uh, the origin. Okay. And eventually, Fermi theory is just the one that you obtain by keeping the, the limit term, the first term. Okay, so this can be approximated, as you know, to be G Fermi, where G Fermi is um, G squared divided by A and W squared. Actually, I think it will be minus, probably. Okay, and there is also an I. Times okay. So basically, your effective theory, okay, apart from the kinetic terms describing uh, describing the, the light particles, is a uh, is uh, at energy much below the mass of the W is the one in which you have uh, G Fermi, okay, minus G Fermi divided by square root two. That's the, the definition, the fact that it's square root two, square root two times uh, P bar gamma mu uh, one minus gamma five neutrons times Times P bar Okay. Okay, so that's very standard. You integrate out the W, that's a that's a process of cooling at the level. But you see here explicitly that your green function can be expanded in a, in, in a Taylor expansion. Now let's do a less trivial, less obvious example, which is a process of doing a loop. So let's consider the contribution at one loop to uh, the following scattering, rho of rho going to x x, coming from uh, vector like heavy force. What are vector like heavy force? Well, uh, are fermions which are colored under a Suzuki color. Hence, I, I call them quarks, but they are not the, the usual quarks. They are uh, other new kind of, of, uh, of fermions. And, uh, and I assume that these, uh, these fermions come in, in uh, the, the coming and fundamentals of, uh, of a Suzuki color. And also, there will be one doublet on the SU2 X and one singlet, okay, which have the same quantum numbers as Q left, doublet, Q left, and the quantum model, and upright. Okay, that's my assumption. So the process, okay, that's the quantum number two. So uh, contribution, so uh, heavy vector like force. Uh, in blue group, going to 
Okay, so the Lagrangian in the two theory is the following. Well, the sum of the Lagrangian plus, so there will be the kinetic term for this uh, heavy doublet. Okay, so it's a, the fundamental of it, okay, it's a doublet of a two electric charge plus six. Plus, I hope to make that there is another heavy core, which I call heavy W. Okay? This is said the fundamental of H3 is a single of H2, and it has a hypercharge plus a third. And then I add uh, a Yukawa coupling because I have to do it. Okay? So this is uh, what we call Y coupling flex. So this is a Q bar taken from the data. Um, U plus the new where H is low. H is defined to be I equal to H star. Okay, where T equal to X on the on the weak uh, I just uh, phase. Okay, so that's the Lagrangian. And now I want to consider this process. So this process, of course, has one loop. So let me denote the heavy modes with a double line. So these are fermions. Okay. So these are two modes. And then there are other cross diagrams. Okay, there are other combinations. For example, if you can you can uh, have one fixed leg here and the new one here, then there are the cross diagrams. So it's, it's not important the form of these diagrams. They are always on these diagrams, okay, where there is a some heavy mode circulating. This, for example, could be capital Q, capital Q, capital Q, U, okay, or for example, it could be U, 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 capital Q, and so on. Okay. Now, first, uh, after that permissivity breaking, this is becoming interaction. We change the masses. Of Q and U, but that's a, uh, an effect which we can neglect. So we assume that as capital and Q has said it to be equal to capital and U for simplicity, and this is much larger okay, than, uh, than the electronic effects, but in particular, Y times B, which would be the effect from this internal interaction. Okay, so the square mass is much larger. Notice that these are vector like modes. Vector like means that for a given representation of the standard model, I have both the left and the right handed canality. Okay. Okay. So I can put them together in one term. That's not like the standard model. Now, if I compute the, the, the amplitude for this process, okay, the amplitude will go like, well, how does should it go? Well, Okay, uh, I, I'm interested in the in the limit in which the energies okay, pumped up in this uh, in this uh, four point function are much is more, much smaller. The energy is much smaller than the mass of this uh, of this particle. Okay, so uh, in this limit, you see that the scattering amplitude will uh, look like a point. It's, it's like looking at this diagram at a very far distance. Okay. And the exchange of these uh, of these particles is uh, can be approximated at a, at a point. So that's the, the local interaction, and this local interaction okay, will correspond. Let me write it here. Will correspond to the insertion of a of a, of a local operator. So what will be this local operator? Well, it has to be built uh, out of the Higgs and, and out of the, of the gluons. Okay. I gauge the variance. I know okay, that it has to be gauge invariance under under color, which means that it can only be since the gluon is uh, is colorless. Uh, the gluons cannot come from covariant derivatives, so they have to come from from free strands. Times again, uh, it has to be invariant under C2 cross U1 and charge. So that's the only that's the only uh, combination I can use. Okay, but there is another one which uh, would be GG tilde. Okay, but uh, but in this case I, I don't 
I can assume that I don't break uh, CP, and, and that's the only possibility is that the only operator which is injected. Okay. So this tells you that you expect, if everything uh, is correct, you expect that, that the, the amplitude will reconstruct with the RF structure. And in fact, okay, if you go to energy, okay, if you, if you do the calculation with energy much smaller than capital M, you will see that the, that the amplitude will indeed be proportional to, will be over the P square, where P is some momentum, uh, okay, called in the, P1, okay, incoming, P2, uh, incoming, then there is P2 outgoing, P4 outgoing, okay. So, and this amplitude will go like P1 dot P2 times the minimum, okay, minus um, P, P, well, let's see, P1 mu, P2 mu. Times epsilon, epsilon, uh, let's say, uh, mu, sorry, mu, p1, and epsilon, mu, p2. These are the polarization vectors of the gluons. Okay, and uh, and of course, of course, times, okay, there will be uh, now, uh, there will be other factors, for example, there will be alpha strong. Okay, divided by four pi because there are two couplings and the loop. Okay, and then there will be y square, okay, where y is the Yukawa coupling uh, that I wrote. Okay, and now a times uh, a loop, a loop uh, function uh, from which I already pulled out two factors of the, of the momentum. Okay, you can check, in fact, this is an exercise that I'm going to give you. Uh, check that the leading order in the momentum expansion, okay, energy, you can you can rescale all the four momenta with the same with the same with the same parameter, and and, and make a Taylor expansion in, in this uh, p in this momentum divided by the capital M, the mass of the heavy moon. You can see that the leading term of p to the zero is vanishing, but it's vanishing because of gauge invariance, because there is nothing you can write with, with, without the input injecting on the gluons. Okay, so that's the first term. And at this point, okay, you see that, that uh, you are left with an integral, which is a loop function, which has dimension like the minus two. Okay, so uh, the leading uh, contribution, the, 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 the only way you know, neglecting at this point, the external momentum, which are already captured by the, the three factor, the only parameter you have at your disposal is the heavy mass. So you will have, y squared divided by capital M squared. So the coefficient here, okay, this uh, uh, effective coefficient at this point will be of order alpha strong divided by two pi times y squared divided by capital M squared. That's your uh, estimate, okay? And the exercise, which I write here, Value of this coefficient. First, you have to write all the terms, okay, all the diagrams, and uh, writing all the diagrams will will, uh, will show, okay, will, will, uh, you, you will find by summing them, you will find that the, the leading term is this, and then you can you can extract uh, precisely this coefficient. But again, you can see that you see that this loop function, well, not, you don't see it now, but you will see when you do exercise, this loop function can be Taylor expanded. In fact, in this case, what can be Taylor expanded is the integral, okay? Then you perform the integral, okay? And, and then you will find the structure. And, uh, and locality ensures that uh, uh, this uh, expanded amplitude can be, uh, can be reproduced by uh, a three level insertion, one insertion of this uh, effective operator with a certain coefficient. Okay, so I think this is a good moment to maybe to stop, but well, let's see. Um, maybe let me, since I have uh, 10 minutes, okay, 
let me let me go on okay so these these examples were pretty simple let me go on and, and, uh, and try to get to a conclusion So, from these two examples and, and everything we say at this point, it should be clear that if my attractive arrangement uh, is written in terms of a series of coefficients times local operators, these coefficients will scale by uh, dimensional analysis. We scale like one over m to what? But then we scale like uh, the, the dimensionality, which I will call d of n. d of n is the dimensionality of the operator of n minus one. Okay. That this is what you expect. Okay, just based on a pure dimensional analysis. We will refine this estimate in, uh, next time, okay, like tomorrow. But just based on the, on, on dimensional grounds, okay, if that this is dimension v of n, okay, this, this coefficient has to have dimension v of n minus four, okay, and uh, and, and the dimensionality is made by the HIV parameter. So, uh, and this is exactly what you find okay, in the example that we we discussed because the operator has dimension six in those examples, and you get one over n squared. Now, what is the effect of these of these operators in uh, in low energy uh, quantities? Well, in, in low energy quantities, they will give a shift. For example, uh, give a shift to the, the scattering amplitude or any any observable. Let, let me call it A, which we go uh, on, on purely on pure dimensional analysis, like the energy relevant for your process. Let me call it E divided by m to uh, to, to this power d of n minus 4 times, okay, times k, where k is the number of insertions of the operator of n. Because now, in these examples, you can insert the operator once, only once, but there are other examples in, for, for some reason in which you the, the, the contribution, the leading contribution to the observable might come at the mention at the two time at two at the level of two insertions. Okay. So that's a, a general formula. And you see at this point that uh, this gives you okay, very, very intuitively, there is no reason of making big theorems, but intuitively gives you uh, the, the justification of truncating here the series. And keeping only the, the, the few first terms okay, uh, according to the precision that you want to reach. Okay? You tell me uh, with, uh, which precision you want to, to, to work okay, in your theoretical uh, prediction. And then at this point, I can tell you which terms you in which effective operators you need to, you need to retain. Okay? So that's the first observation. And the second, so, so the first observation is you, you can. You can truncate and the second the second uh, uh, the, the second uh, observation okay, is that this uh, again is very is very intuitive and uh, I'm sure you already seen it many times uh, the prediction that you're making by using the fact that theory is a prediction uh, uh, done through an expansion uh, where the expansion parameter is energy divided by some shell scale. Okay, so it's an energy expansion. And then just passion means that uh, uh, the way in which you are going to organize okay, this, this, uh, this series, there will be one in which, again, uh, it will give you, okay, uh, so operators which give you the same powers of energy divided by n. Will be uh, belonging to the same class if you want to the same. They will give you corrections of the same order. Okay, so so effective theory 
lies on an energy. Of course, in the fact field theory, you will have an other expansion parameters. You don't have only this expansion, you have multiple expansions. Also, uh, you, you will also uh, have to expand in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the dimensional scalpings. Okay? For example, uh, there will be uh, in, in the theory of Fermi, in the, in the theory by Fermi, there will be other uh, interactions, for example, electromagnetism. Uh, in, in electromagnetism, you, you can do loops, okay? And then you will have also a, a, a series, perturbative series in, in alpha electromagnetic divided by four pi. But in addition to that, you will certainly have an, an expansion in, in, in powers of the energy divided by the heavy scale. Okay. Now, um, yeah, so there is okay, one exception in which things don't quite work. So, which means that uh, uh, the, the facts, so you see here, yeah, the, the observation, of course, is that. Uh, in the limit in which uh, e goes to zero with respect to m, where you want m is much, much larger, goes to infinity with respect to e, then the, the, the effects coming from these heavy modes uh, go to zero. Okay? So this, this, this uh, fraction is uh, smaller and smaller, which means that uh, the, the effects from the heavy physics decouple. That's the, the word that is, that is used. Okay? So new heavy physics, heavy modes. For capital M divided by E going to infinity, or if you want E divided by E, capital M going to zero. Now, what I want to discuss in the last five minutes is that uh, it, it, it's an exception. Okay? So there is a situation in which this decoupling doesn't quite work. Okay? And why does it quite work? Quite work? Well, okay, everything boils down to uh, the presence of, of uh, coupling strengths, which also scale with, uh, with the capital, with the, with the heavy mass. So of course, this, uh, this power counting, this, uh, this uh, estimate based on, on dimensional analysis work because uh, we assume that there are no, uh, apart from these coefficients, there are no other couplings okay, which uh, uh, scale, but actually uh, it, it's a statement that you have to uh, make on the, on the the, the full theory. Okay, so in the full theory, there will be uh, mass scales. In that, in that example, uh, these heavy masses are capital, uh, capital Q and capital U. Okay, and the, and the coupling Y is a constant with respect to these uh, uh, two masses. But there are examples in which the, the, the UV theory contains parameters. Other than the masses, which scale or couplings, which scale with the, with the, with capital M. Example, example, non Example of the coupling is uh, again it's very well known. It's for example, a fourth generation. Heavy quarks. Again, in the process GG going to HH. So it's the same process as before, but now instead of, of considering uh, heavy vector like quarks, I consider a full theory which contains fourth generation of quarks. Fourth generation means that it's, uh, it's a Fermi contact. Uh, which is the same as in the standard model. So I will have uh, chiral uh, fermions. So I will have a left hand chiral here uh, transforming like a doublet. And I will have right hand chirality transforming like a, a down quark. Also a heavy up quark. And then I would, would be able to write in cover couplings. For example, I would have uh, y down. So this is capital Q down y plus y up. So everything like in the standard model. Okay. 
But now the, the, the point is that these, these quarks are, are supposed to be heavier than the, than the sum of all the quarks. And how, do you, how can you get this, this, uh, this heavy mass? Well, the heavy mass, so you see, there is no bare mass here because of, of uh, of course, of, uh, of gauge invariance. You only have the left hand equality here and the right hand equality is uh, over there. So the only mass that they get is through uh, electronic symmetry break. So it means that N capital and uh, capital uh, and U would be Y up V divided by two root two, okay? And capital V would be Y V V over square root two, okay? So these guys can be heavy if the Yukawa coupling is large. So in other words, this limit okay, is, is a limit in which also the couplings explode. Okay. And now you understand why things cannot be coupled, because eventually, okay, if you compute, if you do exactly the same exercise, okay, you can do it. Of course, you can do it. Uh, there are a few uh, factors that will change, but eventually the estimate uh, is the same. But now the, pro the point is that these uh, these uh, Yukawa coupling okay, will scale with the mass, which means that the coefficient, the effective coefficient, will be uh, in, in practice will be constant uh, in this limit, okay? Because y over capital M square okay, is nothing else than one over b square. Okay, so the mass uh, can increase only at the cost of, uh, of increasing the, the coupling, the coupling strength, the new cover coupling. So you see that this, uh, uh, this, this, this situation is one in which eventually uh, what you get is a contribution from this, uh, you, can, you can match to this effective operator, but this effective operator is giving you a contribution which, which goes like energy divided by D squared, okay, which doesn't decouple, doesn't go to zero, in the limit of a, of a, of a heavy, okay, infinitely heavy um, uh, new fermions. In fact, you, you will never reach this, uh, this limit of infinitely heavy new fermions because the theory at a certain point becomes completely strongly interactive because heavy means also strongly interacting at a certain point. Uh, now, it's, it's uh, interesting to see that this non decoupling situation is already ruled out by current LHC data. Because of the following observation, let me write it here. Uh, the same approximation, the same point-like approximation, no? uh, treating this loop as a, as a point, as a, as a local interaction, uh, also works for the top quark. Okay? Works for the top quark in the limit if, if you uh, consider, in particular, uh, a process in which one of the two Higgs is set to its death, and the other Higgs field okay, is set to the physical Higgs model. So this is the physical Higgs model. Okay, so one of the two Higgs fields is, a, is a quantum excitation, and the other is set to a constant. So this means that uh, the, the invariant mass of these two gluons okay, will have to be uh, that of the uh, matched mass of the Higgs. Okay. Now, uh, to compare this energy uh, with two times the mass of the fermion circulating in the loop. In the case of the top, this, this, approximate, this uh, comparison tells you that numerically, okay, might seem a little bit uh, borderline, but in, in practice, uh, you, you find that numerically the amplitude is, uh, is very well reproduced uh, by approximating, by making this uh, uh, Fourier expansion. Uh, let me write because otherwise you don't understand. So the, the momentum is uh, Q squared is equal to MH squared, okay, and this is, can be considered much smaller than two times the mass of the top squared. Okay. So numerically is a bit borderline because the mass of the Higgs is 125 GB, mass of the top is 135, but in fact uh, it works pretty well in describing group 2 Higgs, 
So even in the case of the top, the bottom line of this uh, discussion is that even in the case of the top, I can approximate uh, the Lagrangian uh, with an effective one. So well, let me change the board, and then I will then I will stop. So this means that uh, the top is also the contribution for the top is also described by an effective Lagrangian. Let me write it. Let me write it here. Okay. So if you add on top of the SANA model, you add also this uh, uh, fourth generation of quarks, then uh, the, the, the change, okay, if you want the, 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 the full Lagrangian, okay, so the, 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 uh, the Lagrangian, sorry, the, the amplitude divided by the amplitude in the standard model, let's write it this way, where I only keep the top contribution. So that's the leading one, okay. For simplicity, let me keep only the top contribution. So this is given by what? By one plus two squared, because that's the top contribution, okay, in, in a certain unit. And then and then the contribution from the daily quarks, due to the fact that uh, the, the dependence on the mass cancels out, okay, you can see it here, they will count as two times the top quark. Okay, so this is the contribution from capital U and capital D. And this is a factor nine. Okay, factor nine in the in the sorry, factor nine in the in the cross section. Okay, factor three in the altitude and factor nine in the cross section. And and this is a is a factor which is a, too big to be compatible with the current data. So you can kind of we have measured this uh, this, uh, uh, this cross section for group group equal to Higgs, and, and it agrees to a position which is much better than than uh, the nine, the factor nine. Hence, uh, for generation made of work is uh, is already excluded, and that's that's thanks to the, the non decoupling effect. So bearing bearing these uh, non decoupling uh, uh, situations, which are pathological in a sense, but we understand why. Uh, things that don't quite decouple. Uh, if you exclude these situations, then okay, uh, the, the considerations which I made above are valid. Okay. You can describe your effective theory in in, a, in, a, in terms of a, of a finite number of effective operators. Okay. If you want, you, you you have an infinite series to begin with, then you truncate. Okay, and where do you truncate? Well, it depends on uh, on your precision. Okay. You are making an, uh, an energy expansion, okay? and uh, and, uh, and at this point uh, uh, you, you decide where to where to stop, and you you have uh, a, 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 a perturbative procedure which can be improved. Of course, if you increase your your precision, your uh, and your experiment, for example, you can aim for a, a, a more precise theoretical calculation, and then you add more operators. Okay, I think it's uh, it's time to stop. It's a good point to stop. And the next time, so tomorrow, we will see uh, we will start uh, discussing effective field theories from known UE theories. In practice, what we're going to to discuss is uh, is the is the procedure of matching. Okay, we already did it here in practice, but uh, we will do it uh, in a more systematic way, and we will see exactly. Uh, what are the, 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 the properties of the effective field theories which are, uh, which are relevant during this match? Okay, let me stop here and. Uh, this Thanks point. so much, uh, Roberto. Thanks so much. Uh, so, at this point, I would like to ask uh, uh, the students whether they have uh, any question. Uh, you can raise your hand and then I'll give you the word, or you can write it in the chat. If 
wishful thinking. Um, I'm not going to, to start the event tradition, but I actually have a question. <laughs> you can ask it. Um, but let me wait a few seconds more. No, I mean, uh, why, why people think, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned this uh, a nice example of non decoupling, right? And uh, in that case, you have uh, um, like the new power which becomes large. Right, it's not really a, a mass scale which becomes large, and that and that's a lot the the reason I, I understood that these uh, non decoupling happens. So I want to know whether uh, it's always like that, or or in this just one case, or whenever you try to make a parameter which is a uh, animation, also to speak in nature. Uh, you will get uh, to make this coupling large, you will get to a non decoupling uh, scenario. I mean, is it general? I, I, well, you see, in, a, in the full theory, you have masses, right, and, uh, and coupling. Well, at least if this, this theory, if the full theory is supposed to be, is to, is supposed to be normalizable. Now, there are there are dimension the, the, you might have dimension of couplings. Okay, for example, a cubic interaction among scalars. Uh, and again, at this point, uh, it depends whether you. I, I think it, 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 I think this, this, this uh, conclusion is, is pretty general because you have masses and couplings. Okay, these couplings can be either dimensionless or or dimension full. Okay, in, in the case of a normalizable theory. Now it depends whether these uh, these uh, these couplings can scale. The dimension of the coupling can scale, right, with the with the with the masses or not. That I think at this point, for example, for the case of a cubic interaction, it, 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 I think it's your choice. Okay, you can take this uh, cubic interaction fixed, right, and and, uh, and take uh, the low energy limit, and then there will be the coupling. But if you scale. The cubic coupling, then I think there will be again a non decoupling effect without electronic symmetry break, you know, without this potential break in the symmetry. Here, the, the couplings are dimensionless, but there are really two masses because of the electronic symmetry break. But I think it's a, the, the conclusion is pretty general. Uh, I don't know whether there is a, there is a counterexample, but I think it's a, whenever the couplings, the non decoupling can come, can come from, uh, from couplings which scale with the, with the masses. I think that's the that that the or, that's the origin of, of the coupling. Whenever these uh, these couplings are, are fixed, I think you will decouple your. Work. So there is a in the literature there is a, a lot of discussions about the so-called upper keys the Karatsore decoupling theorem, but I didn't mention it because I think it's a, every time I, I discuss about this I, I think about this theorem. I, I think it's, it's confusing. <laughs> so I think here it's very simple. Okay, there is dimensional analysis which, which tells you that okay that formula, and that that formula is assuming okay, that the only parameters which uh, can uh, can become large are the masses. If that is true, I think it's unavoidable. In fact, there is a there is a paper by what by Weinberg uh, where clarifies that there is no subtlety behind this. Okay. Again, at the time, there was a lot of discussion about this upper case character theory, and then Weinberg said, look, simply dimensional analysis. There is nothing mysterious. Of course, with the caveat that if the coupling scale with the masses, then you can have this, uh, this pathological uh, situation. But if, if the couplings are fixed, then I think there is no way to avoid okay, that, that, that conclusion over there. Thanks. Yes, we have a, a question from Eric. Um, Eric, do you want to ask him yourself? If so, let me um, let me see if I found you. Uh, let's go. I uh, will. Um, yeah. Me... Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Please go ahead. Cool. So the heavy vector-like quark uh, example. The second example of your effective field theory. Um, 
you you said that this operator C, G mu nu, G mu nu, H dagger H was the only local operator you could construct from gauge invariance or something. So I, I didn't follow this step. Yeah, so you right. went for the heavy loop and then you said the only local operator you could. Yes, like, principle, there is another one, which is uh, field But this violates CP, okay? So this is CP violated. Okay, so this I don't get if the original Lagrangian, which unfortunately I canceled, does not violate uh, CP. Otherwise, you will also get this. Now, why, why this is the only one? So suppose the CP is not broken. Why this operator is the only one? But it has to have, you know, it has to give a contribution uh, to two gluons, two Higgs, uh, green function. Okay, so it has to have at least two gluon fields and two Higgs fields. Okay. Now, the Higgs fields, since the gluons are, are neutral under SU2 cross U1, okay, then H, the, the two Higgs have to be contracted in, into a singlet of SU2 cross U1. Okay, and uh, of course, that's the leading term. I'm huh? sorry, maybe I didn't say this worse, but this is the only operator at the leading, leading term. Of course, there are additional operators that you will get in the next. Uh, levels of the expansion, uh, which will have more derivatives. Okay, so there, there might be more derivatives acting on the Higgs field. For example, you could have oh, G mu mu G mu uh, rho, and then you can have G mu H dagger B rho H. Okay, but that's dimension A and has two more derivatives. Okay, so that's a bleed. At the leading order, okay, there are no derivatives acting on the Higgs field. So the only possibility to get an SU2 cross U1 invariant singlet is to make H dagger H. Again, the gluons, you, you need to make a, a singlet under color. So you cannot have G mu, G mu. Not G, sorry, G mu, G mu. So this is not a, a, an invariant under SU3 color. So you have to pull out two derivatives out of this loop, right? And you construct a twist strength. That's the only possibility. And the, and the, again, because the, the Higgs is not polar, so there, there cannot be derivative, uh, covariant derivative acting here carrying gluons. So the only possibility is to have G mu squared. That's the leading term. Then, of course, there are other operators that you can construct with more derivatives. For example, derivatives can also act on the field strength. But these are dimension eight operators. Okay. So that's the only, these ones and this one are the only two possibilities. Right. Thank you. That was very clarifying. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. So I suggest we stop it here. Roberto, thanks again for your lecture and see you tomorrow.